we all know I am a shoulder and elbow surgeon for 18 years now who does a lot of shoulder and elbow trauma. So I'm gonna show one of the most difficult, interesting and lovely cases of my life. And uh, let's start with, with this. So this, one of, this was one of the most interesting cases I have ever had. So this case was about a 38 year old lady who lived in the Amazon. I use it to operate in the Amazon strongly as my, uh, my Indian friends know from, 2000, from 2011 to 2019. And this is an, an Amazonic lady who had a proximal humerus fracture in the right shoulder in January, 2018. She lives not in a big city, she lives in a faraway city, but is a very, very oriented lady. Uh, a fetus plate was done by a local trauma surgeon, and the surgeon said to the family that the surgery was fine and everything would evolve nicely. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the patient evolved with strong pain since the very beginning of the post operative scenario. The shoulder developed very, uh, very fastly stiffness post-operatively, and such problems were never getting better after surgery, month after month. As per the patient and as per the family, the surgeon was always saying that everything was fine. And this lady, she was 115 kilometers away from the capital of the state on the southwest of the Amazon. So finally, she went for a second opinion with the local orthopedic surgeon and the local uh, shoulder surgeon uh, saw the case. He could understand what was going on. And he gave me a call here, 2000 kilometers away from him saying that Houston, we have a big, big problem ahead. So that was the AP X-ray of the patient about uh, 11, 10, 11 months post-operatively. That was November, 2018, 11 months post-op. Uh, I'm gonna comment the AP X-rays, uh, the AP view in a minute, and that was, uh, and here we can see for us who have a good experience in the area, that that was a posterior dislocation, anterior or posterior, but I'm gonna show you the CT in a, in a minute. And that was indeed a posterior dislocation. I'm coming to the X-ray in a minute. That was a well-positioned left view, but it's not so conclusive as we all know. If we take a better look on the AP view of the shoulder, this is in green, the glenoid, and this is here, the proximal humerus. So it's obvious that it was, that was uh, a locked anterior or posterior dislocation, but you are gonna see the CT in a minute, and a CT was obviously mandatory. I would like to highlight that this lady leave it 150 kilometers uh, inside the rural Amazonic area in a way that we don't have all of the nice exams that, that we would have. So she, so she did a CT in old fashion in which we, all, we only had the axial cuts, okay? But this is the CT in the axial view in which we are seeing this 11 months or 10 months, 10 months post up. So what are we seeing here in this CT? The humeral head was posteriorly dislocated and some screws of the phyllos plate, they were destroying the glenoid. We all have experience. I have a lot of experience in this field. So we can easily say that those screws, they were scratching, I would say, the glenoid for a lot of time because it takes a lot of time to have all of this indentation of the screw causing all of this uh, bony defect on the articular cartilage of the glenoid. And uh, gentlemen, she's only 38 years old. This is another CT view. And we can see here no 
previous signs of drilling in the humeral head, okay? And if we see the other, this other cut, this other image, a little bit higher, again, no signs of previous perforation on the humeral head. So we discussed this case a lot of time. It took us a lot of time to figure out what we would do. But the thing is, to the best of our understanding, I feel very tranquil to say that much probably that was, in the beginning, a three-part posterior fracture dislocation, or maybe a two-part, but I'm pretty sure a three-part posterior fracture dislocation. And to the best of my understanding, the colleague would not have noted that the humeral head was posterior dislocated, and hence he fixed the humeral head on the glenoid. And this is why this, she was having a lot of pain since the beginning. And in my opinion, uh, uh, considering that the, there were no signs of perforation in the humeral head, I can assume that this, the, the, the real diagnosis was not fully understood by the local orthopedic surgeon. And now I have a patient basically 11, 10 months after surgery, 38, 38 uh, years old with this scenario, uh, a, a, a clear destruction of the glenoid, which was being scratched by some uh, screws of the phyllos plate, uh, a chronic, uh, dislocated humeral head, which was unquestionably um, going to, to AVN, much probably as a shoulder and elbow surgeon, I can say a very, very suffered rotator cuff. She was in agony, uh, to be very honest with you. Her life was going bad. The marriage was going bad. She was fighting for, uh, for her, uh, from her job. And she was in, in agony and that was the bomb we had to fix. So before I show you my friends what we did, uh, Dr. Vincenzo, I would like to hear you with this very, very easy case, my good friend. Thanks, Sergio. I think you did the, the, the summary very nicely. The fracture was never reduced nor fixed adequately. Yes. Um, I think maybe this was a true part because I don't see any signs of bone healing, both in the lesser and in the greater uh, tuberosity. So I think this was a two-part posterior dislocated okay. humeral head okay. uh, that was never reduced nor fixed, never. as I mentioned, you mentioned also. Uh, there is an injury on the articular surface of the glenoid, but again, the, the, the patient is very young. Very young. There, is no, there, are, no, there, are, there are no signs of, a, of a, a vascular necrosis of the humeral head. And in my opinion, if you allow me to move a little bit further, I think uh, with this age, with uh, a, a humerus head, there demonstrates no signs of a vascular necrosis. Uh, I think we have to try to do an osteotomy and redo or, or at least try to do uh, a very nice osteosynthesis. I think this is the only, the, the only way to try to salvage this humerus head, but the patient has to be completely aware that with this procedure, first, this, this humerus head can now have an avascular necrosis. Even though the humerus head has no signs of avascular necrosis and there is a secondary bone healing, after yeah. the secondary procedure, yeah. she can experience pain because she has a very large damage of the glenoid surface. And we don't know for sure the profile of the rotator cuff. Yes. And uh, after all, she can have a third surgery because she can had the fracture healed with no signs of a vascular necrosis, but she can experience pain and she will need a third, a third surgery. But I, I will try to, to do a an osteotomy and a fracture reduction and another fixation. 
even with the quality of the glenoid, Dr. Vincenzo? Yes, because of the age of the patient. I think okay. we have to try to, to salvage this humor head, but we have to put the patient completely uh, aware oh, that she can aware. have a bad, a bad outcome. Yeah, she, she can, despite, despite of an adequate reduction, if the fracture heals adequately, if the, the humor head is still shows signs of uh, uh, no signs of a vascular necrosis, she can keep on experiencing uh, a dysfunctional pain. And because of that, she can need a third procedure, maybe, maybe in this third procedure to do a replacement. But I will try in this secondary procedure to salvage the humor head. Okay, and, uh, and if you operated this lady in an ideal scenario, would you have in the operation theater a prosthesis ready to be used or, or not? This is a lovely question. In the secondary procedure or if no, I was no. treating the in patient your... since the beginning? See, uh, if, if, if she came to you and, so, and you said, okay, I'm going to try to do a reconstruction, uh, an anatom uh, uh, I would say a reconstru uh, reconstruction, would you have by safety uh, some kind of prosthesis in DOT to use as a plan B? Yes, for sure, for sure. I okay. think it's necessary to have a prosthesis in the operating theater because yeah. you can be the best surgeon, you know, but anyway, you cannot be, you cannot be successful in reducing and fixing this, uh, this fracture. So okay. I think it's necessary to alert the patient that maybe she can go for a open reduction and internal fixation, and at the end, she can have a replacement. Lovely. Uh, I would like to listen, uh, Dr. Gustavo, Robinho, Dr. Luiz Henrique. Do you want to say something about this case? I think that it's a very challenging scenario. I would like to listen to you boys before I show what I did. Robinho? Sergio, uh, it's a challenging case. It's a malunion in a patient with a 38 years old. But I, I always tried to do a reconstructive procedure. Uh, I, I think it's helpful in this case to use a, a 3D uh, printing uh, for preoperative planning to help the procedure. And But I, I always I try to do a reconstruction. I fully agree, but this lady is living 150 yeah. kilometers away from the okay. only big city of the state. And I use it okay. to operate there for eight years. So I try to do an osteotomy, an intraarticular osteotomy and fixation okay. with a plate, screws in the right positioning. Okay. And do you consider that intraoperatively that would be impossible? Probably. Uh, it, it can happen. <laughs> it can happen. But I think uh, we have to try to do a reconstructive procedure. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, it's possible, but uh, you have to, 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 to have two uh, possibilities, the replacement and the, the osteotomy. I try to do the osteotomy first. Uh, okay. And if you had a replacement in the OT, what kind of replacement would you think about? As a shoulder surgeon, I tell you, a hemi, a TSA, a total shoulder arthroplasty, or a reverse. But we have to take into consideration uh, that the glenoid much possibly would be destroyed. And we have to think about the status, the status of the rotator cuff. Having said that, what kind of replacement would you have in the, in the OT, Dr. Robinson? Probably a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Uh, actually, I don't do this procedure, but I have my friends who do it uh, so much Lovely. better than me. Uh, I have my colleagues of the shoulder team, and probably yeah. the choice of, for this patient would be uh, the, the reverse shoulder. Good. Lovely. Uh, Vincenzo, uh, do you, uh, well, the, the other two panelists, they can speak if they feel comfortable too or not, but do you want to say uh, anything else before uh, I show you what I did and my, my rationale? Sergio, 
if you yeah. don't mind, uh, it's important for a few comments. Uh, yeah. I think the patient is about uh, 130 kilometers from the capital, right? Yes. yes. But uh, the patient got a very nice plate. It's not usually to have this kind of plate and uh, very, very uh, cities Far around the big capitals. So uh, yes. there's a big problem because they got a colleague doing a surgery with a very nice plate, but yes. he didn't get to the reduction. Yes. So for this kind of place, the, this kind of patient, it's very important to uh, reinforce the, the, that you have to uh, be sure that there is correct reduction of the dislocation for the head is inside the glenoid and uh, is about to get reduction for the, the, the factor outside. So uh, I think we'll try, like uh, Vincenzo and uh, Robson, uh, as commented, we try to reduce and fix again. Uh, we try very, very, it's very important for about the age of the patient. And uh, even with the glenoid is uh, some uh, uh, problems, but we try to uh, refix the fracture. Okay, good. Dr. Vincenzo, I am controlling the time. Do you want me to show what I did? For sure, but if you allow me, you know, just one comment more. Sure. Uh, I agree with what uh, Luis just mentioned that although we are talking about a patient that lives 100 or 200 kilometers far away from the capital of the state of Amazonas, okay. uh, she had a very, a very nice and fancy plate to okay. treat her fracture. Or, sure. or, or, or at least to mistreat her fracture, but she had it. <laughs> And yes. again, we are yes. discussing yes. about, yes. Uh, yeah, and again, we are discussing about, uh, you know, fixing and or, or redoing, redoing the, 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 the fixation with an osteotomy or to replace it. And if we are talking about replacement, uh, we are discussing about a reverse total shoulder atroplasty. So although we, again, although we have, 20 kilometers far away from the capital, okay. we still have some resources. You, you no, know, we still, I, and, I, I, and I can understand that we still have no, no, some no. resources. No, so if we have some resources. Yes. No, I just want to tell you that she has insurance. Had, no, she had insurance. She had insurance. And uh, she would have access to a reverse with the insurance, but definitely that would not be people with uh, such capacities to do that in the small city. So this is why she came to the capital. No, I understood that. But uh, what I mean is that if she has some resources yeah. and very nice facilities to yeah. have, have to get some exams, some preoperative exams, okay. I think if we are thinking about to do a reversal and we yeah. are thinking about maybe that there is an option to instead of doing the reverse, we can do a total shoulder, a conventional on one. The, yes, but we that have would, to stretch. Yeah. yeah, we we have to stratify the condition of the rotator cuff. So yes. again, if she has very nice resources and, yes. and, and, and 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 nice facilities, she is a candidate as one of the preoperative exams to get an MRI because with the MRI, despite the implant and the artifacts, we can study very nicely the, the function and the fat infiltration of the rotator cuff, and we can classify according to Goutalier. And, and also we can, we can measure the volume of the deltoid muscle, because yes. so far in the literature, this has been shown a good, a good, factor in terms of prognosis, even though we are thinking about to do a reverse. Okay. So before the surgery, the definitive surgery, I would go for an MRI study, mainly for these two aspects, to study okay. the viability and the quality of the rotator cuff, and also to measure the volume of the deltoid muscle. If, Very well if we have Boutalier, less than two, and okay. we have nice deltoid, 
I would say that maybe she can have a total a conventional yes. proximal humerus replacement. If okay. she has a gutalier greater than two and a very nice volume of the deltoid muscle, I would go for a reverse. Uh, yes. So my comments are, we didn't do an MRI because we would be absolutely sure of the artifacts that we would have because of the plate. And we asked it for an ultrasound that uh, was not very conclusive. But as a shoulder and elbow surgeon, well, what was my rationale? The thing is, the, the status of the cuff would be quite bad. And I was absolutely sure. I didn't do any pictures intraoperatively because I went to a city in which I, I had never been, that was not my crew, and it was a very, very tense, tense surgery. And this procedure took five hours in my hands. So we knew that the status of the humeral head would be quite bad, and I was absolutely sure that was the worst humeral head I have ever seen in 17 years doing this. The glenohumeral status of the cartilage was very, very bad. And we were ready. We had completely given up the idea of trying to do a reconstruction because we, we knew that it would be in a quite bad status. And I was ready for a TSA or a reverse. That was one of the most difficult surgeries in my life. I have a lot of experience with complex shoulder and elbow trauma as a shoulder and elbow surgeon. And it took me five hours to do that. So that was the incision that I have done. This is one week post-op. That is my incision, a, cl a classic extended delta pack. But take a look at the previous incision. That is a non-existing incision. So it, do, so it just gives me fuel to conclude that the previous doctor didn't know exactly what he, he was doing. So the status of the rotator cuff was extremely bad. So intraoperatively, we decided to do a reverse. I did it. So these are the perforations of the screws on the shaft. This is one week post-op, the left view, and this is the axillary view for pedagogical purposes. Here I am showing you the clavicle. Here I am showing you the coracoid in green. And here I am showing you the acromion. And I knew that it would be challenging to do a reverse in a 38-year-old uh, 38 lady who was suffering incredibly. So this is two months post-op absolutely lovely external rotation. The subscap was completely gone, but many papers are saying that the pec major can compensate internal rotation. I have other cases in my office with uh, re reverses in all the patients, of course, with similar scenarios. And she was having, of course, difficulty in the scapular plane elevation because of adherences in the anterior inferior capsule. So this is her now four months post-op, very good external rotation, still some difficulty in internal rotation, and still it was not easy to do elevation. See the scapulothoracical compensation, but with good physical therapy, this is her eight months post-op and with an outstanding result that was a, this is my best result in the 20 25 reverses i have done in the worst case my best result in the worst case okay lovely and then the pandemic came and the patient came after one year this is the last time we saw her september 2020, she was coming to the city again, one year, eight months post up. Everything was doing fine in the, in the X-rays, the AP, the axillary view here. 
And this is the last time we saw her. She uh, was using a mask because of the pandemic. I, I like to say everybody gained weight with the pandemic, but she lost weight. And this is absolutely fantastic. I would never expect such a wonderful result. This is my best result in a reverse in 17 years in the worst case. So she is absolutely aware of all of the problems we may have in the future. And I conclude telling you that I am already preparing an article which will be published in October in Argentinian uh, Orthopedic Association magazine about the challenging of doing a reverse in patients below 40 because of this case. The guys of Argentina, they got crazy with this case and they asked me to write this article. And this is uh, her, her elevation. So I conclude saying this. A reverse restores the, the, the center of rotation. It tensions the deltoid, which uh, would be quite good in such a young lady. And it uh, allows good ROM as we have been improving the technique. And it's a good solution for many cases without any panacea. Take home message number two. It was uh, the classical indication as a shoulder and elbow guy, I am is uh, an irreparable tear in a pseudoparalytical shoulder in a patient 70 plus. Okay, we feel comorbidities, lucid, active, and collaborative. In 2008, we were uh, discussing this, but the limits of science have evolved in the last 12 years. So the indications without any heroism and any panacea, they are increasing. Proximal humerus in fractures in elders, we know that's too much, but in very complex sequelae of the shoulder, it can be done regardless all of the problems in the future. This patient, she told us to conclude, Doc, if you are giving me, as you are telling, 10 to 12 years of uh, uh, a painless and good clinical scenario, and I was, my life was being destroyed by that, I will thank you too much, and in 10, maybe 15 years, then we will see what happens. And I worry about that but I am very proud of my surgery and my decision making. So I just wanna say thank you to